an idea to pitch you on. Let's do it. <laughs> I'm uh, intrigued already. <laughs> So my choice to start out in law and then come back to film is entirely my father's fault. When we were growing up and um, my father, Sterling Van Wagenen, was building the Sundance Festival and Institute and putting that together and we were, you know, just running around on the ski slopes and getting into trouble and not really having a clue, he always dissuaded us from getting into film. He understood the risks, he understood, uh, you know, that it's not a very good financial decision to go into a career as a filmmaker in films so he he discouraged us and um and i was never really i never really planned on be, on getting into the film and working in the industry um but i always had sort of a tangential interest just because of the work he was doing and and uh so in law school i took a lot of entertainment law classes a lot of intellectual property law classes um, soft IP, and then uh, during law school, ended up working at New Line Cinema in their business and legal affairs department. And so really trying to understand the inner workings of a studio, the contracts, um, what goes into all the business and legal decisions that go into what you see up on the screen. And that was interesting to me. That was fascinating to me. So that was kind of the path I took and practiced law for four years. Um, but I guess it's in the blood. And, and eventually I came back to working in in film as a producer and head of XL Entertainment full-time. Um, I mean, at some level, uh, the business and legal side of filmmaking is, is like any other kind of contractual thing. It's, it's, it's a contract. Just because you insert the name of a star or you insert, you know, some, some aspect of the filmmaking process doesn't make it that interest still reading a contract um, but I think I think what I enjoy most about the filmmaking process um, is seeing all of the different pieces come together so F, F. Scott Fitzgerald has this great quote about the film business that you know about the whole equation and, and there's only been a handful of men at any one time who have been able to sort of hold the whole equation of film um, in front of themselves. There's so many different facets and so many different aspects, so many ways to fail in the filmmaking process that I think that that risk of failure and when it actually does come together, even in an imperfect form, when the, the legal needs and the financial needs and the creative needs all sort of work together, um, that, that coalescing of those different aspects, I think, is what's most interesting to me. I'm the product director for film at XL Entertainment, uh, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of Deseret Book. Um, we have a primary responsibility to cater to and, and create product for the LDS or Mormon market, which is sort of a subgenre or niche of, of religious or spiritual or faith-based cinema. Um, it's a genre that's been proven over the years to have an audience and to be commercially viable. Um, even though it's very niche. And, and so my job is to acquire and source and build relationships with filmmakers in order to release new films. As you can imagine, there are some restrictions when you work for a, a entity that's owned by the LDS Church. Um, I'm not like every other distributor out there. I can't fill my slate with um, anything that there's an audience for which there's an audience. I can't do rated R horror uh, one month and then find a family friendly film the next month. I mean, we're, we're very focused and very niche, which I think is a strength, but also a limitation. We also can't finance our own films. So we finance P&A or prints and advertising dollars for a release, but we don't typically finance production on a film. So that's, that's a challenge to go and find the right kind of content that's a fit for such a niche audience when we don't also fund it. So um, th those two limitations combined um, make the job a little bit hard, but also it's part of the reward, I think, is overcoming those two challenges. Um, one of the things I do to help filmmakers, I think, is to overcome sort of the stigma of being a quote-unquote Mormon filmmaker. I've had that conversation with several filmmakers who are worried about um, pigeonholing their careers or being branded as a Mormon filmmaker. 
And, and I can understand that perspective to a certain degree. Um, but if you were raised Mormon and if, and, and I mean, it's a, it's a culture that demands a lot of us. And so I think if you're raised Mormon, you are Mormon, whether you stay in the church, don't stay in the church, it's, it's part of your identity. And I think we need to sort of be brave enough in some cases to, to embrace our own identity and our own stories. That doesn't mean everybody who's Mormon has to make a Mormon movie. Um, but if they have something to say, uh, we need the best storytellers to be willing to say it and to be willing to explore all the different areas of, of what it means to be Mormon because it's not a monolithic thing. There's a lot of diversity and there's a lot of nuance. And, and I don't think we've sort of gotten there with our storytelling yet to be able to tell more fringe narratives, um, more nuanced narratives. And so, you know, I think I, I just try and encourage if, uh, filmmakers, if you've got something to say, you've got a story, don't let that fact, the fact that it's Mormon dissuade you. Just make a good movie. Make a good movie, period. And if it's got Mormon characters and Mormon themes and Mormon stories, if it's well told, if it's well crafted, if all of the elements come together, that, that will become secondary, the fact that it's quote-unquote Mormon. Yeah, so I mean, Richard Dutcher sort of blew the doors open for Mormon cinema when he released God's Army and said, we can do legitimate full-length feature films about our people and our culture, and people will pay to watch that. Um, I grew up in a very different sort of culture. Even, even growing up in Salt Lake, it was a different kind of culture being around Sundance and having sort of an affinity for secular independent film. And I had zero interest in Mormon cinema when it first kind of came onto the scene. And, and I, was, I was a little younger in, in college when, when those films were first coming out. Um, and, I, and I think I didn't have an appreciation for what Dutcher and others after him were trying to do in this space. Um, I've since gotten to know Richard and, and my role at XL Entertainment and, and think he's still to this day, you know, one of our most talented if not the most talented LDS filmmaker we've had. And, and um, you know, maybe one day we'll get him back into the fold and, and get a production going together, which I would love uh, to do. Richard, let's talk about it. Um, and I think he's, he would be open to that idea. But um, I, I thought it was very brave. I mean, it was a, it was a risk to kind of go into this very niche space. Um, but I think Richard saw the, the depth and the sort of complexity um, of, of the human experience within Mormonism and, and said, we can explore that. There's dramatic stuff to mine there. Um, and I think he was right. Um, I don't know if there's a recent, I, th I think the recent shift in the audience, um, what's clear to me is that it's no longer sufficient to just label a film LDS and expect people to show up. Um, the standard of craftsmanship and production is so high and comes at so cheap a cost, a price now, when you can pay 10 bucks a month and get the kind of quality of production on Netflix and Hulu and Amazon, it's harder and harder to get people to go out to the theater. And those people who do go out to the theater are expecting $100 million productions. And so as Mormon storytellers, we can't just say, well, it's got Mormons in it, or it's a Mormon story, ergo, you should come. I mean, that, those days are long gone. So the onus is on us. And despite the fact that we're always going to be restricted with our production budgets and what we can do from just a pure production value standpoint, we've got to, we've got to have better scripts. We've got to have stellar actor, actors and performances. We've just got to make the very best movies we possibly can in this space, or there's no reason people will come. And I think that's always pushing the envelope. That, that also means we're exploring new subject matter and we're, and we're going to different places. Now that's a risk too when you go out and you do things that haven't worked before and you, ha and, and you haven't tested certain subjects and certain stories. Um, but I think if, if we play it safe, um, it's, it's gonna just kill it, kill the genre. Yeah, so you, you, you've spoken with Sterling, so you know how scrappy and how small and how you know, grassroots, the early days of, of Sundance. And now, of course, it's a big corporate event and it's Hollywood comes to Utah for 10 days a year. Um, so Sundance alone, I mean, the growth of that enterprise has just been phenomenal. And I sort of got a front row seat to watch all of that happen. 
Um, in addition, on the on the LDS side with Richard Dutcher, I mean, there's been a real explosion of filmmaking and production on that side. And now you see more recently sort of big, high dollar, like, bona fide legitimate productions coming in like Yellowstone, like the Disney series. Um, you know, we used to have the, the old Everwood and Touched by an Angel series. Um, but then with the, the advent of tax incentives in different states and needing to compete there and needing world-class facilities, we've sort of, we sort of struggled for a little bit, but now we're catching up on the tax incentives and in terms of the facilities. Um, you know, I remember being a young attorney, um, green right out of law school working with a very talented very smart entertainment attorney named joe pia and we were trying to figure out ways to get a studio built and just see the industry really take off and it, and man it was the hardest longest problem and it just never happened and so i was really excited to see you know the the utah film studios finally come online finally come to fruition and see that build out and i think it's a it's going to be a huge cornerstone for continuing the growth of the industry here So I remember, um, you know, the very first time we came up here and there was a public event and, and groundbreaking and we were just standing here in an empty field and Marshall had his shovel and uh, there were a handful of other people, the owners had come out. Um, Marshall Moore, who was the head of the, the Utah Film Commission at the time, um, talking about this and everybody in the industry was sort of curious, a little bit cynical, a little bit skeptical. And there they were with their golden shovels doing the first sort of digs. Um, and Marshall said something that was that always stuck with me. And and he's you know the, the goal is always to attract the Hollywood dollars here. And I think it's important to know that those Hollywood dollars get spent here and they create jobs for Utahns. This isn't just you know a thing where we subsidize or support Hollywood, but they they come and really support our industry here. And that was part of it. But Marshall also said at the time we've got to grow the industry internally we've got to help the local filmmakers and and i've seen a you know watching this kind of go from that early ground digging to what it is now where you've got you know three huge sound stages full sets full rigging um you know to see it lively with the yellowstone folks here and blood and oil before that is is pretty damn cool so the highlight of my acting career um, the absolute zenith heyday for me as an actor was my face as a as a eight year old boy framed in a bus window, and and it just passes across the screen in a film called The Trip to Bountiful that my dad produced back in 1985, and and the only reason it's amazing is because the woman's face in the bus window right behind mine as it goes across the screen was Geraldine Page. And um, she went on to win the Best uh, Actress Academy Award that year. And that was, that was, that was the only like, real acting moment that is even worth talking about. Yeah. I'm, I'm not an actor, and I don't think I ever could be. But, but I have a huge respect for that craft and what, those, what, what real actors do psychologically, physically, mentally, emotionally to sort of train for a role and get into a role um, is just remarkable to me. So my, my answer is going to be much less highbrow. Um, I, I sort of have always gravitated to, towards coming-of-age movies. Um, and there's two sort of coming-of-age movies that stand out to me just off the top of my head. One is called Breaking Away, which won the Best Academy Award, Best Screenplay in 1978 or 79, I think, um, about four friends who were just graduating high school, and there's a sort of a culture clash between the local kind of kids who come from, uh, they're all children of stone cutters. And so they get, they get labeled sort of pejoratively cutters by the, by the rich um, university students. And so they are always sort of clashing and trying to figure out who they are and their place in the world as sort of poor working class kids. Um, so stories about poor working class kids have always stuck with me. And then there's another great little film called This is England. Um, that came out um, probably a decade ago um, by Shane. I'll have to look it up. Shane Fellows, I think, um, is his name, and a great little film about a kid who's lost his father and gets uh, falls in with a group of neo Nazis, and uh, they befriend him and take him under their wing, and and uh, he has to sort of figure out where the evil sort of um, 
political ideology of that group is versus the feeling embraced and welcomed into a into a group of kids older than himself. I, I'm proud of um, a couple of projects that I've that I've worked on. I've been really blessed to work with um, T.C. Christensen, who I think is you know our most prolific and 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 you know successful filmmaker of the last several years. Um, and in my time at Excel, um, you know, we've been exploring, not always commercial, with commercial success, but we've explore, been exploring boundaries. So there's a film, uh, a really micro-budget film called The Last Descent about um, um, man, it was a which was a difficult production, but um, when uh, John Jones got stuck in that cave, in the Nutty Putty Cave, and um, you know, we were able to tell that story um, in some small way. Um, you know, that that was a hard undertaking, and 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 I'm proud of that for s s several reasons. Um, a small film called Just Let Go, I think, was another film that, you know, took some chances, took some risks that didn't pay off. Um, that I was proud of, and then most most recently, there's a, a really eloquent and really beautiful film that we're just finishing post production on called Jane and Emma. Um, about the story of a black Mormon pioneer, Jane Manning James, and her struggle with early racism in the church and, and her friendship with uh, Mormonism's uh, founding matriarch, Emma Smith. And there's some real complexity and real beauty in that story and written by Melissa Lilani Larson and directed by Chantel Squires. And uh, that's, a, that's a story that um, not a lot of Mormons know about, but has deep impact and deep meaning, I think, as a, uh, for our people and our culture and our where we are with race relations in the LDS church. Um, we've got several scripts in development. Um, we've got a, a, a really good, a really fine script written by Cole Glass about three Mormon friends who get drafted into Vietnam and, and have to sort of reconcile, you know, a Christian life with the violence and terrors of that war in particular, the specific terrors of that war. Um, we're going into production on a, a follow-up to, to the very successful um, Once I Was a Beehive with McLean Nelson. Um, so that will go into production. It's called Once I Was Engaged. Um, starts shooting here in the next couple of months. Um, and Mitch Davis is releasing his sequel to The Other Side of Heaven, which will be a, a, a big, big deal in our market and in our space. So we're looking forward to that next year. Um, and then, yeah, just trying to find, find good new projects I love my pops, and I think he's done some really remarkable trailblazing stuff um, in the state and with film and independent film. Um, but for me, the best part of it was was just him coming to us on a Sunday evening or you know any day of the week really, and um, and saying, "Arthur, just come watch the first five minutes of this movie or the first ten minutes of this movie." And that was sort of my film education. We had thousands of movies on on laser disc and other mediums and formats, as if you can imagine that. And we'd pop on a laser disc and just and just watch um, movies together. And I remember distinctly, um, you know, him pulling me out of school when I was in first grade to go see Return of the Jedi on, on opening weekend, opening day, down at what is now the Broadway um, Broadway movie theater. Um, and you know, taking me out of school to see a midnight showing, or ma making sure I, I skipped school the next day, but he, he let me stay up for a midnight showing of Akira when it was playing at the Tower. Um, so just having a love of movies and seeing how film um, really has sort of shaped my worldview. I think there's, a, there's another great quote, and it might not be from F. Scott Fitzgerald. You'll have to double check me on the quote. But it was something like, if you, if you want to understand a man, you know, ask him what his favorite films were by the age of 15, and you'll know everything you need to know about, about that man. And that, that's sort of how I see film. It, it, it's a beautiful medium that, that informs how we see the world and it makes us more empathetic. And when we sit in that dark theater together and we have this collective experience as audience members, and, and if I can put myself in the shoes of a poor gay black kid, you know, when I watch Moonlight and come away feeling somewhat of, of the life that that character has lived and I feel more empathetic, then film is, has succeeded. And, and that's my hope with all the stories that I work on is that some character or some aspect of the film will help create more empathy in the world. I need a, yes. All right. One of those? Should have done that at the beginning. <laughs>